started here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our colloquial speaker, Gwen Pei Fong. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Northwestern University. Uh, she started her career as a biologist and a physicist at the same time at MIT, and then did a PhD at, um, at Harvard, and then was an Einstein fellow at uh, Stewart Observatory in Arizona, and then um, made her way to Northwestern. Um, Gwen Pei is an expert on, on gamma ray bursts, and she particularly likes the short ones, the shorter the better, yes. right? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, that's a great interest here, for, especially for their multi-messenger uh, signatures. Uh, she's won many prizes and done, done great in her, in her career. Uh, she's a new, one of the newest members of the Packard uh, Fellows family, which is fantastic. Um, so without further ado, since we all want to listen to her and not me, <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, let's listen to her. Wait, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ooh, that's a sensitive mic. Thank you so much. It's been really, really fun um, to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. And it's like my first in-person colloquium in a long time, actually. So this is really exciting. And I actually was um, delayed on my flight yesterday in Chicago because there was like a hailstorm outside. So there was like a ground stop at O'Hare. So I'm very excited for this weather. Like maybe I like, I told my husband like maybe I'll, I'll come back in a few days <laughs> um, instead of say a few more days, but it's been really fun. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about neutron star mergers, um, some of the fastest transients we know of, and also applications um, to the emerging, very thrilling uh, field of fast radio bursts. And there's experts in the audience on all of these subjects. I hope to try to provide a complimentary view. Um, all right. So I would be remiss if I didn't thank the uh, hardworking and inspirational team that I work alongside. So um, several uh, postdoctoral fellows, uh, postdoctoral associates who have moved on to bigger and brighter things, and um, five uh, PhD students. So a lot of the work I'll be talking about is really a celebration of their work, um, and I'm really just kind of managing, uh, managing them at this point, but they're really the driving force behind them. Um, in particular, uh, Anya and Genevieve will be graduating next year, so please be on the lookout um, if you're interested in hiring in, in gamma ray bursts and host galaxies. Okay, so this is just a very big picture basic slide. We have um, small stars like our sun, they end up as white dwarfs, larger stars, more massive stars, have a more explosive ending, um, and end up as neutron stars and black holes. These are the compact objects that we're very excited about studying. Um, and in particular, if you take two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole, put them in a binary system together, eventually they collide over millions and billions of years, uh, you get really exciting, brilliant displays of light across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, they also are probably, if they're highly magnetized, they give rise to magnetars, which um, in transients we kind of invoke um, in any situation where we need like an extra energy source and we don't know what's happening. Um, and so you'll see magnetars kind of pop up throughout this talk as well, both in gamma ray bursts and in the fast radio burst sections. So the um, main objects that I study are neutron star mergers. Um, you've obviously heard of these probably being at Caltech, but we have two neutron stars or a neutron star in a black hole in a binary. They um, in spiral over time, giving off gravitational wave radiation. And during that process, when they get really close, they actually tidally eject some of this material. This material is not necessarily neutron rich, and that produces a hotbed for um, our process nucleosynthesis or the rapid capture of neutrons onto heavy elements um, isotopes. And so that gives off a specific type of transient called a kilonova. Um, this, these two neutron stars, or neutron star and black hole, go on to merge and produce a central engine with a transient accretion disk. And that transient accretion disk powers a gamma ray burst, this relativistic jet. Um, and so every time we see a short gamma ray burst, we're really staring down the barrel of the jet, uh, mainly. And so, you know, NASA satellites are able to detect these. So we've been finding these for a couple of decades. And in general, these are very br brilliant, uh, colorful displays of light. So the kilonova generally peaks in the optical and the infrared. Um, this is because generally they're kind of redder transients because the higher opacities due to the heavy elements involved kind of um, make them peak in the infrared bands. But they're kind of silent in the radio and x-rays. Whereas this afterglow emission, 
where you have this short gamma ray burst that uh, runs into the surrounding medium, produces broadband synchrotron emission, and that's detectable in radio through x-rays. So they're really exciting, brilliant, colorful displays of light. So even though they're called gamma ray bursts, they really emit across the EM spectrum. So this is our general picture, but I'll kind of give you a little bit of context for this kind of origin story in this picture was not um, observationally confirmed until kind of recently. Uh, you may be familiar, gamma ray bursts come in two flavors. Uh, so if you actually just look at the prompt gamma ray signal and divide it by their duration, um, this is a histogram of number of bursts versus burst duration in the gamma rays. And you can see this you know, division at two seconds. And so anything less than two seconds is considered a short burst. Um, this is what a short burst looks like uh, in the gamma ray. So it's a very clean kind of um, here and gone signal. And um, you know, the analogy they like to give is you know, short gamma ray bursts happen in the blink of an eye. So it's over like that, um, whereas long gamma ray bursts you know, depending on how you like your eggs, it's about the time it takes to fry an egg. Um, you can probably find, find a gamma ray burst of uh, adequate duration for you. So that, but still, you know, they're, they're pretty fast transients. So for a long time, these two phenomenological classes um, were mapped to two different progenitor scenarios. So long gamma ray bursts are definitely um, associated with the core class of massive stars, some of the most massive stars in the universe. Uh, because they are associated with type 1c or these strip envelope supernovae that have lost both their hydrogen and helium envelopes. And they're also almost, they're basically exclusively associated with star forming host galaxies. So this um, progenitor picture is solved. And this one, um, we think that short gamma ray bursts come from neutron star mergers. And again, we've kind of collected recent evidence for that. Uh, but to complicate matters, there's definitely a crossover in the populations as two second divide is not um, set in stone, so I'll talk a little bit about a long GRB that we discovered last year from a likely neutron star merger. So a long duration burst, a 50 second burst that had a kilonova and probably came from a merger. And we also have an example, at least one example, um, from Tomas here of a short gamma ray burst that came from a massive star collapse. So there's definitely a crossover, but we think the majority of each population kind of maps to these different progenitors. So there's early predictions um, for uh, neutron star merger origin. This was not all set in stone. Um, you know, so just to provide context for why study short gamma ray bursts to begin with, um, but it was not always clear why, um, uh, what causes them. Um, and so the back you know, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, there were theoretical support, but not necessarily observational support for this origin story. Um, Neil Garrels, who the Neil Garrels Swift Observatory is now named after, um, passed away um, in the past you know, decade or so, but he had um, great foresight. So in terms of trying to kind of really understand and pinpoint the origins, um, he, gravitational waves were really a critical test to their progenitors. Because we know gravitational waves um, give rise to neutron star merger, or neutron star mergers give rise to gravitational waves. So if we actually, um, he said this in, in one of his lectures, we'll find out um, once this thing called LIGO gets working, um, if we see them at the same time as short bursts, we'll know that we uh, really nabbed it in terms of we really nabbed the origin. So um, we definitely nabbed it in 2017, and I, I won't talk too much about GW170817, but this was a discovery of a neutron star merger by LIGO um, in conjunction with a short gamma ray burst. And so you can see this characteristic chirp signal and frequency uh, by one of the LIGO detectors, and then followed by uh, multiple satellites, Integral and Fermi, actually detecting gamma ray light. So this was a really, really, you know, among many, many other things that this event brought us, was a very exciting um, test of the origins of short gamma ray bursts. So now we can kind of go forward and use short gamma ray bursts as probes of, um, of neutron star mergers across the universe. So in particular, what can we learn from these neutron star mergers? Why study them at all? So they're the origin of heavy um, or R process elements or whatever's in this person's mouth. Um, this type of you know, heavy metals, like the fundamentally where do metals come from? I made Bob cringe, so that's always good. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so this is, you know, trying to reproduce the solar R process abundances, in uh, particular, like the lanthanide series, a atomic mass numbers of greater than 140 are difficult to reproduce in your typical um, soup for collapse supernova. And so maybe neutron star mergers could account for um, most, if not all of those. You can understand, um, you know, high energy astrophysical processes not seen elsewhere in the universe. So for instance, the formation and structure of relativistic jets. 
we can understand, um, because of the R process, we can actually also understand the impact of these rare explosions on the environment as well as chemical evolution across the history of the universe and how actually those elements get incorporated into galaxies. And finally, we can hope to maybe understand a bit about the equation of state. So when two neutron stars merge, I said they produce a black hole, but maybe in some cases they could actually produce a heavy neutron star depending on the maximum mass of allowed neutron stars um, and the neutron star equation of state. So many, many reasons to study neutron star mergers. Uh, and this is really an observational golden era because we have, um, this is a, an artist rendition, not a real, real image, um, but we have on axis uh, cosmological events from the best and brightest um, uh, satellites from NASA and Neil Darrell Swift Observatory is really good at detecting and localizing gamma ray bursts. And then the Fermi satellite as well, which provides a very prolific rate of short gamma ray bursts. We've now detected these out to redshifts of two or so um, with a median of 0.6, so it's really a cosmological population. Whereas uh, local mergers are really being complemented by the advanced era of gravitational wave detectors such as LIGO, um, and we're all excited for O4 to, and scared, uh, for O4 to come online um, soon. And they provide a complementary view of looking at these um, mainly from um, off-axis angles because LIGO doesn't really care where the gamma rays are pointed or the jet is pointed, and so they're more likely to see these mergers off-axis. But they also, their sensitivity is not as great as these gamma ray burst missions, so they're um, closer in. And so they, they, it's a really great time to be studying mergers. Um, so at present, short gamma ray bursts do, do represent a major route and um, provide a prolific stream of electromagnetic counterparts for us to compare to LIGO events. Another thing is that gravitational wave astronomy will um, you know, eventually push beyond the local universe. So this is um, a map of kind of the simulated neutron star binaries, um, mapped to kind of future gravitational wave experiments. And you can see that we'll start to kind of push out to redshifts of one and beyond. Um, and so currently we're trying to um, you know, search very, very large haystacks and try to make the needle as small as possible to find our favorite electromagnetic counterpart. Um, but they're very, very large localization regions. Hopefully, eventually, the localizations will um, become better, especially with this next generation um, experiments, and we'll be able to actually um, search smaller areas, um, but they'll also be fainter, too. But um, short gamma ray bursts, because they're detected out to redshifts of two or so, provide a great baseline for future GW detected mergers. So chasing gamma reverse in practice, I always like to put the human element in the story. And I know many of you involved in DTF and other experiments or um, NDSA and others are very um, uh, used to kind of dropping everything and running. So maybe you'll identify with this a lot. So um, this was a particular um, gamma ray burst that happened on Thanksgiving. So um, this was in 2018. Um, and my, I was at home in Rochester, New York, and my father was cutting the turkey. We had a great dinner. Um, then Swift detected a burst, like just as I was about to fall asleep, I got a text message from my phone. Um, it was a short gamma ray burst. Um, my phone blew up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I learned from my students these, how, how to make one of these. But, um, and then actually, I love this story because Dr. Carrie Patterson, who was a postdoctoral associate in my group, was actually at the Caltech RLR um, uh, observing with Keck. So we actually were able to um, look at it and find an afterglow. Um, and uh, actually this, this makes me sound terrible because she was working on Thanksgiving, but she also um, had not, <laughs> didn't actually know exactly like what Thanksgiving was about at the time, but she got like extra, extra vacation later. So anyway, I always like to put that caveat. Um, and so we sent an email to, you know, a thousand plus astronomers um, all before the sun rose. So this is kind of like the human element of this story. It doesn't always happen like this, um, but it was very exciting to be able to use facilities like Keck to actually, um, to actually nab afterglows. And this one, you go after every single one, so sometimes you don't get a detection and it's really sad. Um, but in this case, we were actually able to discover a very distant, and this is distant for short gamma ray burst, um, uh, galaxy or optical afterglow localized to a galaxy at redshift 1.7. Um, and this made major news because it was the most distant optical afterglow ever detected. Um, we were in the teenage years of our universe. Now I know like people who study very high redshift things will laugh at that. Um, but really um, the, the uh, high redshift short gamma ray burst population actually probes kind of these faster mergers. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But this was just um, kind of a, an example of the type of science that we're able to do if we kind of follow every single one. 
Okay, so this is a general outline for my talk, so the um, match to guiding questions. So one of the things I'm really interested in studying is do all neutron star mergers, do neutron star mergers, sorry, account for all heavy elements in the universe? Uh, and for that, I'm looking at a study of kilonovae from um, cosmological short gamma ray bursts. I'm also interested in um, studying the environmental conditions that give rise to these mergers because they're fairly rare explosions and also diversifying the known galaxy population. So we've um, published now a legacy sample of environments that I'll tell you about and then also leveraging this toolkit to other emerging fields. So I've become really interested in studying the environments of fast radio bursts. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Okay. So um, the first topic of trying to understand the R process and whether neutron star mergers um, are you know, a major source, if not um, responsible for all of them. So you must be familiar with this periodic table color coded by um, the origin. So sort of anything in this bright yellow color is from merging neutron stars. Um, thanks to GW170817, we now actually have observational confirmation of that. But if you actually put this together with many other different um, kind of uh, our process uh, element prediction. So this is uh, rate of the R process producing event versus the mass per event. So we have just different predictions from our own kind of rare earth studies, um, dwarf galaxies, so kind of metal, um, kind of the star by star analysis in dwarf galaxies. And we put 170817 here um, and then also match to limits from uh, PTF in terms of the rate um, and short gamma ray bursts and then um, taking like a range of ejected masses. We see that 170817, that first neutron star merger, kind of sits well above these curves. And so this actually tells us that if all events have similar yields to 170817, or you know, the inferred rates are just based on that one event alone, we may actually produce, overproduce the known R process. But of course, there's uncertainties in all of these rates. This is also just based on one single event. And so it's useful to take advantage of the short gamma ray burst population to actually try to make some headway in that. So it's important to really try to quantify the objective masses, which I'll show is really difficult, as well as the event rates. Um, and it's challenging because it's rapid, it's faint, um, and it's infrared. Um, I was actually reading over Shri, one of Shri's papers on the plane ride over, and I thought that this was nice. Sorry, um, Shri, we, we changed Macronova to Kilonova over the years. But basically, um, he postulated that the origin of short gamma ray bursts, you know, um, albeit with the, the future gravitational wave interferometers, will undoubtedly motivate us to mount ambitious um, Macronova or Kilonova campaigns. So we have actually been doing this um, and going after these kind of cosmological short gamma ray bursts like crazy and mounting these ambitious campaigns. These are actually really difficult to study because when we have on-axis orientations, we actually have to contend with that afterglow. That afterglow is again from the interaction between the uh, circumburst environment and, and, it occur, and, um, uh, and the jet, and it occurs at all wavelengths. And so, um, you know, optical, infrared, x-rays, et cetera. It's the brightest and first thing, uh, um, long wavelength signal that we see from short gamma ray bursts. Uh, and so we kind of have to wait for that to fade on this time scale of days, and then we hope to find this kind of kilonova bump or this like red excess afterward. And so the first bona fide candidate for uh, cosmological kilonova was this in 2013, so 10 years ago, um, 130603b. And so uh, the community was able to track the afterglow, um, and then you can see this kind of red excess at late times thanks to Hubble Space Telescope that was indicative of a very red new component. So this was, the, you know, this is the type of data that we often deal with. This was at redshift point three. So that's fairly nearby for a short gamma ray burst. Um, but, you know, we're only able to get maybe generally one or two HST data points and it's very difficult um, before the launch of JWST, of course, very difficult to actually get spectroscopic confirmation. But we still do try to launch these ambitious campaigns to try to understand the um, objective masses because it's kind of the only way we can do it in advance of the gravitational wave era. So these years of ambitious campaigns have led um, to, you know, moderately fruitful effort. We have about a dozen candidates um, and many upper limits. So this is an example of, um, you know, one of these kind of redder excesses. This is a particularly well sampled event, um, 160821b, for anyone who knows um, the GRB literature. Um, and this is uh, the same GRB, but you can actually get great constraints. This is from Muncie's work on that same GRB um, on the ejecta mass and the expansion velocity. 
And this is just kind of the proof of concept from a single um, upper limit or two upper limits from Keck. So you can start to kind of constrain this parameter space from these upper limits. And so kind of motivated by these early studies, my student Jillian Rastinajad actually published a late time study of um, 85 short gamma ray bursts. We were trying to constrain this ejective mass, ejective velocity space. And so basically the darker the kind of the colors are, the more gamma ray bursts that rule this parameter space out. So you can see, you know, for about 15% of the sample, we're ruling out um, ejective masses and velocities similar to 170817. So already we're kind of seeing a spread in terms of the ejective masses. It's not like neutron star mergers just prefer kind of one single ejective mass. Um, so this is kind of proof of concept for the um, many upper limits, but in these uh, many years of campaigns, we've also discovered a couple of surprises that I'll share with you now. So surprise number one is a potentially um, a very, very bright kilonova. Again, this is a candidate um, with a potentially very large ejective mass. So the idea is that um, to create a very bright kilonova, you either have to play with something like your radioactive heating um, to actually boost the luminosity of your kilonova, or maybe you invoke, as I promised in the beginning, a magnetar. So we have, um, if you have two neutron stars, they merge, um, they, and uh, at least a magnetar is created and stays at least um, temporarily stable to collapse. It can actually um, impart some of its spin down energy behind the kilonova ejecta. Um, that spin down energy goes into making that, um, ionizing that ejecta, making it transparent to x-rays. So we start to see x-ray emission. Some of that um, emission also gets thermalized into the optical and radio. And so we're left with maybe like a boosted signal by a magnitude or so, where we can actually um, get a much brighter kilonova than just from radioactively powered kilonovae alone. So um, I have observations of possibly a magnetar boosted kilonova. So this was a um, uh, HST observation and you can see this source um, fade over time. It's kind of close to the nucleus of this irregular looking galaxy. Um, and this is luminosity versus time. For This is um, typical radioactively powered kilonovae down here, 170817 and that 160821b object I talked about. And then we have our magnetar boosted candidate that's 10 times brighter than any candidate we've seen, but too faint to be an afterglow. Um, and if we believe this, then you know the ejected mass is something like 10% of a solar mass. But of course, this is based on just a handful of data points and really um, uncertain. But it's kind of um, you know the implications, if true, is that you know the range of ejected masses from you know less than a tenth of a solar mass or less than 0.01 solar masses all the way to 10% of a solar mass means that we kind of really have to understand the distribution of ejected masses from a large population of events it kind of complicates the problem of understanding if all neutron star mergers create the R process. Um, but the upshot is that if, the, if there's more than one of these magnetar boosted scenarios, this actually bodes well for future kilonova searches because they're brighter, they're going to be easier to detect um, falling gravitational wave signals or in untargeted surveys. So this is a kind of exciting surprise. Another surprise that I alluded to in the beginning is a um, neutron star merger from a very unexpected source. So this was um, led by my student Jillian Rastinajad, and there were several other um, papers in the same issue of Nature that co-discovered this kilonova, um, but I'll highlight her work here. So this is the classic um, hardness ratio, so this is basically the ratio of energies in two different gamma ray bands versus this gamma ray duration. And generally long GRBs are in this cloud, short gamma ray bursts are in this cloud, you know, you can see substantial overlap. Long gamma ray bursts, again, should come from the collapse of massive stars. Um, you know, again, a, about how long it takes to fry an egg. This one um, sat squarely at 50 seconds, so really like at the center of the long gamma ray burst population. It's not even close to the short GRB, long GRB divide. Um, and we actually were motivated to target, target this with Gemini and CMMT uh, because it was nearby. So this is actually, um, you know, observations of the transient and we, uh, there was a long gamma ray burst, so we expected to find a supernova. But when we matched it to models, it looked a lot fainter, more like a kilonova. It was very red, and I'll show light curves in a second. Um, and it was associated with this nearby galaxy. So we got Hubble Space Telescope mid-cycle observations to actually place constraints um, to very deep limits on a galaxy. So the luminosities that we can probe are like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 or so um, solar masses. And so we're able to actually 
um, constrain, you know, or rule out the possibility of it coming from a coincident, very low luminosity source and strengthen this, um, this uh, host association. And so these are the light curves. So again, not going through all of the details, but this is flux versus time um, and various um, afterglow models. And you can see this excess here um, in the K band is kind of what we, um, we claim as the kilonova. But moreover, if you actually look at the spectral evolution, so now going from, this is um, in frequency or wavelength or frequency um, versus uh, apparent magnitude. At early times, you can see the SCD is fairly flat and then it steepens significantly. So it has this characteristic kind of blue to red evolution. That's a telltale sign of a kilonova. So again, um, we would have loved to get JWST observations, but this was discovered in 20, um, December 12th of 2021. So it was before it had launched. So um, we, we hope for another event like it to actually get real confirmation. Uh, and so this was actually the first time that a kilonova was um, uh, possibly discovered from a long duration gamma ray burst. So with every kind of new um, superlative discovery, this opens up the door for m many, many different questions. So for instance, do we need to account for some long gamma ray bursts when, um, when figuring out if neutron star mergers um, uh, produce all of the R process? So there's, is there a kind of correction needed for the neutron star merger rate? Um, what is actually powering the gamma rays? Because we didn't really address this question, but it's a long duration burst. It's actually kind of hard to get in a neutron star merger scenario that much matter around in your disk to be able to power such a long burst. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, now if you take this same burst yeah. and put it at a redshift of, let's say, 0.8. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. We kind of looked into this. The problem is you also get like the, the energy band will change over time in terms of redshift too. Um, and I, you probably wouldn't get this long tail, but this is a very, very high signal to noise. So I think you would still get these two spikes and it would still be a large T90. Um, but I don't have that exact calculation, but I, I still think it would be over two seconds. Yeah. Um, but it is complicated by the fact that your, your kind of rest time energy band also shifts when you go to higher redshifts. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, that is a question I had raised to our collaborators before of like, are we only seeing the tip of the iceberg because it's so nearby? Yeah. Okay, another question. Okay, um, so this opens the door and then also um, what's powering the gamma rays and then prospects for joint gravitational wave detection. So really to actually solidify these origins, if we found a long gamma ray burst in connection with a gravitational wave event um, that would actually solidify that long gamma ray burst also can be producers of neutron star mergers. So this like complicates the picture, but it's also really exciting at the same time. We can also place um, constraints on the ejective masses and velocity. So these similar plots that I showed you for different um, components, the red um, kind of red dynamical ejecta and the blue kind of polar ejecta that's squeezed out at the pole. So we can start to kind of map out this parameter space. But again, the fact that the boxes are kind of all appearing at different places means there is kind of a diversity of ejective masses and we're only kind of starting to skim the surface. So certainly we're looking forward to 04 where we're gonna be able to actually constrain the ejective masses really, really well um, for a few events. So spectroscopic confirmation um, would be great to actually start constraining the compositions because you know, there's a lot of different input assumptions that go into these models. Um, there's also, we expect object to object um, variation and the nucleosynthetic yield. So it will really be important to build a large population. And finally, we need to consider all possible sources of neutron star mergers. So I wouldn't have thought like, you know, 25 years after the um, launch of SWIFT that we'd, um, or 20 years after the launch of SWIFT that we'd actually have um, a long GRB created by, from a neutron star merger, but anything's kind of possible. Okay, and one thing that's actually kind of cute is um, we can actually probe the presence of um, magnetar. So if a magnetar actually is created at the center, um, not only will it kind of boost your kilonova signal, but at late times that spin down energy can also maybe be deposited into kind of a slow moving radio shock. So basically this um, slow moving ejecta, so kind of sub relativistic uh, material and the interaction with the environment will produce kind of a slow moving uh, radio signal that's detectable on your time scales. And so I presented kind of two surprises um, and um, uh, surprise examples where maybe we have this magnetar boosted kilonova 
Um, and so my student Genevieve Schroeder is actually looking at radio emission to try to constrain this and actually find um, signatures of magnetars for the first time and in the radio. Um, so these are just different models. So far we found all upper limits, um, but we're patiently awaiting VLA observations here to try to um, see if we can actually see an co independent confirmation that a magnetar actually existed in this event. Um, we're doing the same for this um, long GRB kilonova because one of the possible scenarios for powering the long um, gamma ray burst is maybe a magnetar was actually creating um, an extra energy source, um, but so far upper limits too, but uh, stay tuned. Okay, so the next part of, the, yeah. The Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That should be ejected at 10 minutes of 53. Yeah. It's not the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that should be 10, 10, 10, yeah, 10 minutes of 53. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the total will be 10 minutes of 53. Yeah. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm saying, do you, do you think that it's a big or dead possible? So, no, I mean, it's, a, it's an optimistic scenario. So, it's, it's um, you know, the maximum. Uh, been done energy extracted from like a cold rotating neutron star of like 2.2 solar masses. So it is, um, yeah, it's, it's an optimistic scenario that we're trying to constrain now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna turn to environments and host galaxies and trying to understand how we can um, constrain neutron star binary properties in turn, such as the delay time distribution and things like that. Um, and so why study host galaxy environments? Um, it gives crucial context. So if you just saw this owl in isolation, you would probably assume it like was born in a forest or something. Um, but actually by studying its environment, you get a lot more context. It actually was born in a cactus, which is weird. So um, providing um, host galaxies um, can actually lend crucial context. I wanted to wake people up a little bit, so I put in that slide. Um, so why study um, host galaxies? And so this is a um, example of a short gamma ray burst host galaxy. This is um, where the afterglow was, and this is an HST image long after it's faded. So you can see it's kind of far offset from this host. Um, when we zoom in, what's happening is, of course, we have two massive stars. Um, one massive star goes supernova, produces a neutron star. Um, and then the second one goes supernova, also produces a neutron star. It's left with some um, systemic velocity um, from the two individual neutron star kicks, um, and then also this delay time before we find the short gamma ray burst. So we do expect kind of moderate offsets, um, you know, coupled with the neutron star kicks as well as the delay time. Um, and we can actually use environments and stellar population ages to kind of constrain this time scale. This is really important for understanding things like the rates of neutron star binaries across time um, as, and, you know, consequently their nucleosynthetic yields. So come some guiding questions um, specifically for host galaxies is we can understand when in the universe they were created, um, how long does it take them to merge, so what are their delay times, um, and to get a handle on that we can use things like red shifts as well as their stellar population ages. And um, this gives us a handle on the rates over the universe's history, um, chemical enrichment, and delay times in turn. We can understand where they occur in their host galaxies. I won't talk about this as much today, um, but you know, in their offsets, you know, this is very offset. This is kind of unusual for transients, for neutron stars to kind of be able to merge and move over time. That's kind of um, you know different from typical massive star transients. Uh, and so we can actually use those to constrain things like neutron star kick velocities as well as orbital properties. And finally, what types of galaxies do they originate from? So similar, um, you know, overall demographics, um, stellar population properties, we can actually um, constrain the conditions for formation and merger. And we um, have now a population of almost 100 uh, short gamma ray bursts, uh, actually more than that, and about 85 host galaxy associations. So this really is a beautiful sample to work with because um, we only have one bona fide neutron star merger with an actual, localized to an actual host galaxy. So it provides really a terrific baseline to understand these um, very hot systems, um, but over a, a larger cosmic scale. Uh, and setting the stage for the next era of gravitational wave discoveries too, host discoveries. Um, and so this is a project I started too long ago. Um, so this is um, me in the Magellan Control Room in Chile in 2010, observing probably like one of some of my first short GRB hosts. Um, and this was passed on to my student Anya Nugent, who's now a fifth year, um, and this is her in the, the remote observing room uh, that we now have at Northwestern during the pandemic. So she was able to start taking her own observations. 
Um, so our process was to really image the location of every single Swift short gamma ray burst. Um, we launched in 2004, identify host galaxies, collect the relevant imaging and spectroscopy, and then perform analysis like stellar population modeling and really go after every single uh, um, event. Uh, to do this, we use a number of large telescopes and thanks to our great partnership with uh, Caltech and our access that enables uh, access to Keck time, we're actually able to get really the faintest host um, from Keck that was otherwise not possible. So um, really 8 to 10 meter class telescopes uh, as well as um, those in space. So we have this, um, I forgot to, say, to point out the acronym, I'm very proud of this. Um, we created a broadband repository for investigating gamma ray burst host traits or as an homage to them being the brightest transients in the universe, we called it BRIGHT. Um, it really is a short gamma ray burst catalog, but the S didn't fit in with the acronym, so we just dropped it. Um, so we have 84 host galaxy associations. This is three times any existing sample, um, many different instruments, and then you know lots of images and spectra. So a lot of data to mine through. And again, we um, it's kind of painstaking because in advance of kind of these deeper imaging surveys like Legacy um, and others, we had to kind of painstakingly collect this multiband photometry of these like 23rd, 24th magnitude host galaxies, um, obtain their spectra. So this is an example of um, you know, a Keck star forming galaxy uh, and then get sh short GRBs. Um, so we basically published all short GRBs for which host galaxy associations are feasible. This is just a placemat of some of them and some of them have poorer localizations than others but we're able to use things like probability of chance coincidence, um, so probability of associating um, a gamma ray burst location with its host galaxy to actually try to um, pinpoint the location and host galaxy of every single short GRB. So we get in for, uh, lots of rich information like the stellar population properties, the offsets, um, you know, stellar mass, et cetera, et cetera. And overall we're diversifying the um, known population. So we're finding fainter host galaxies than we were discovering before, um, more distant, uh, and then at larger offsets. So I'll show a couple of these results. Um, this is our process also. We model galaxies with Prospector. I know many of you are familiar with here who work on host galaxies. Um, and this is just an example where we jointly fit the spectroscopy and um, the photometry. And it took a while to actually get this running. Um, but now we actually kind of have full posterior distributions in each of these properties. And this was a very inhomogeneous field. You know, people model ga host galaxies in very different ways. So we kind of wanted to homogenize all of this. So we find um, demographically that short gamma ray bursts mostly occur in star forming host galaxies, but with about 15% in quiescent or so-called transitioning off the main sequence hosts. Um, so the sizable fraction of kind of older stellar populations means that you know, there's a broad range of um, stellar population ages. Compared to kind of well-known galaxy relations such as the star forming main sequence, so this is specific star formation rate versus stellar mass, we could see that short gamma ray bursts generally track, you know, the star forming hosts generally track the star forming main sequence, but there's, you know, definitely a quiescent population. And I just wanted to point out these kind of two local universe GRBs. This is this long GRB from the Kilanova. Um, it sits kind of right on the star forming main sequence. And then NGC 4993 is the host galaxy of 170817. So you can see even kind of within the local universe, we're kind of spanning the wide range of um, host ga or galaxy properties available. So this is really consistent with a broad range of delay times. Um, so if we go back to kind of early predictions of the delay times of neutron star mergers, because this is not a very well constrained, uh, short gamma ray bursts offer a great large population to actually study this question of how long it takes two neutron stars to, um, to eventually merge. Um, so this is based on kind of early work from stellar population synthesis where um, this dashed line, you can see, you know, there's a prediction of um, a peak at less than 100 mega years. Um, and previous short gamma ray burst studies were kind of finding, you know, greater stellar population ages of kind of greater than a giga year, much greater than a giga year. And so um, we couldn't actually re kind of reproduce this lower peak. And so one question that we're kind of trying to answer with this catalog is, is there some evidence for like a fast merging population? One of the ways that we can actually um, look at this is the redshift distribution. This is kind of an indirect way to do this. So this is a redshift distribution from our sample. Um, and you can just kind of pay attention to the, the purple histogram. But you can see that we're starting to fill in this population greater than redshift 1.5, um, which was not really known before. 
to our, our techniques and persistence and trying to track down every single short gamma ray burst has um, uncovered this growing more distant population. Um, and we are finding that, you know, if, this is a big if, um, they formed around the um, epic of peak cosmic star formation around Redshift 2, then their merger time scales um, must be fairly short for them to have merged by Redshift 1.7 or 1.5 or so. So maybe this is an indication of a, a faster merging population. And indeed, this population does have younger stellar population ages than these lower redshift events that have probably longer delay times. Um, and another way to actually do this um, is to actually use our prospector inputs as um, into a kind of delay time distribution full analysis. So the expectation for two neutron stars that merge um, and given you know, a log normal distribution and orbital, orbital separations um, and typical gravitational wave losses is a t to the minus one um, uh, power law uh, just from kind of pure gravitational wave losses. Um, but we're finding actually from our work that we're actually getting a much kind of steeper power law and that generally means a kind of faster population of mergers, a, a larger number of mergers that are kind of at um, short merger time scales. Um, but we are finding a minimum delay time of about 180 million years. This is definitely longer than your stellar evolutionary um, time scale for these massive stars. Um, so it's kind of closer to reconciliation of you know, shorter delay times, but, um, but not quite there yet. So this begs the question of is there a kind of a faster um, channel needed? Um, and especially for producing the, the R process too, this, um, you know, it feeds into things like when was the universe chemically enriched and things like that. Um, and so uh, another kind of interesting uh, um, observation is maybe there is some evidence for like a fast merging um, population. So the um, motivation for this is the dwarf galaxy Reticulum 2 seems to have enhanced um, europium abundances or R process abundances for at least seven out of um, nine of its most metal poor stars. And so this is, um, but we don't actually see dwarf galaxies um, in our population. Um, and also because of the, the large neutron star kicks, um, the escape velocities you know, in dwarf galaxies are much lower than your typical massive galaxy. And so it's hard to imagine a um, neutron star merger with like a long delay time that occurred in a dwarf galaxy because by the time we see it, it would have like escaped the galaxy. Um, and so this is very preliminary work. We are starting to look, we have about 10 very, very faint host galaxies with maybe two bands of photometry from HST. And we're using um, Prospector Beta, which basically takes um, galaxy prior, so the stellar mass and redshift distribution, um, and actually has priors based on the you know, galaxy population. Like it would be unlikely to find a massive elliptical, well maybe not with JWC, but it'd be uh, you know, less likely to find a very massive galaxy at redshift you know, three or so versus redshift point um, one. And so preliminarily we're finding that this population kind of sits right here, uh, potentially in closer to the dwarf regime. And this is, um, you know, new work that hasn't been published yet. It's very preliminary, um, but potentially we're starting to find um, evidence for a for a low luminosity host population. Okay, um, I'll take like five more minutes on FRBs and then have ten minutes for questions. So, um, so yeah, those are the two um, neutron star merger um, uh, sections, and then how we can actually leverage this toolkit to other emerging fields. Because I know there's people interested in fast radio bursts here. Um, so I just like to say that like I'm kind of lazy with um, with what I study. So you know I go from GRBs to FRBs. They they look the same kind of. Um, in uh, this is but this is in radio light. This is in gamma ray light. They're both kind of millisecond time scale transients um, and um, only kind of at least in, at the first emit in one band. But fast radio bursts generally almost exclusively emit in the radio band. Um, yes. What? Oh, F and G, what about it? F and G. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so they're bright, fast millisecond radio pulses. They're much more common than GRBs. Um, some have been observed to repeat, which is a major mystery. Um, there's connections to magnetars based on the coherence of the emission, the energy scales, um, et cetera, um, but they're, and their polarization properties, um, but the precise origins and formation channels um, are really uncertain. 
And so major open questions we're trying to understand are what are their progenitors, what the heck causes these, um, are they distinct for both repeating and non-repeating FRBs, um, you know, what causes some FRBs to repeat, is it a formation channel thing, is it a completely different progenitor, and then what clues can be gathered from their host environments. So I'm part of this fast and fortunate FRB follow-up team, or F to the fourth, um, in conjunction with um, the University of Chile and Santa Cruz. And so we basically pr um, get inputs from these various FRB experiments, um, you know, with varying degrees of good localizations, <coughs> and they kind of trigger a range of follow-up, particularly on their host galaxies. Um, and so some of the early work that we looked at was actually um, looking at a sample of these well-localized FRBs. Um, and using HST, we found that a lot of them seem to be correlated with the spiral arms of their host galaxies, although not always on the brightest regions. So this again um, points to a potential correlation with um, star formation um, and kind of you know, normal run-of-the-mill uh, core collapse supernovae type locations. Um, so maybe all of them come from kind of what I call normal magnetars where you don't have to invoke a very interesting um, channel. Uh, but of course, this is a very small subset. Some of these FRB localizations are quite poor. Um, but you know, when you actually dive deeper from a global scale to a local scale, um, they occur in kind of seemingly different local environments. So just these two examples, um, there's a, a, a fast radio burst in conjunction with a galactic magnetar, so that actually solidifies the origin for at least one FRB. Um, but then we also have um, an FRB that occurred in a globular cluster um, in M81, and it's obviously a very old nine giga year population. Um, and so Kyle's work here in the audience um, and others showed that maybe a delayed channel must be necessary just to explain these local environments. Um, and so to try to get at this question, I worked with my PhD student Alexa Gordon to actually collect 23 host galaxies, um, six of which repeat, um, and six are new to this work. And we kind of used um, a, a range of different experiments, but mainly focused um, with ASCAP, the, the CRAFT collaboration. So we found that overall there's, um, we did all this prospector modeling, et cetera, the same that we did for short gamma ray burst hosts, and we're finding that overall their stellar population properties are not very distinct between both repeating and non-repeating FRBs. Again, this is very small samples, um, but these are essentially, these boxes show the, um, the quantiles and then these um, dots are kind of outliers. Uh, and you can see that for each uh, property, so mass rated age, uh, stellar mass, uh, stellar metallicity, um, specific star formation rate, like at um, recent star formation rate in the last 100 million years, we're not finding um, very distinct populations. However, we also um, undertook a star formation history analysis, so analyzed their, um, we did non-parametric star formation history, so we're able to recover um, their star formation rate um, as a function of look back time. So going from right to left on this plot is kind of going back in time, um, where this is kind of uh, the redshift of the FRB, and then you're going back in time um, uh, in the galaxy's history. So we actually do find that all um, um, FRBs, sorry, all hosts with very prominent rises in their star formation histories um, do host these repeating FRBs, so maybe there's some connection between the repetition rate or the activity of an FRB and kind of recent star formation. Um, but this is again kind of a little bit hand wavy. Um, and again, um, we are finding an emerging range of global environments, so not only on the local scale, but also um, it was always thought that they all come from star-forming galaxies, but if we actually look again at the star-forming main sequence, so this is across different redshift ranges, um, color-coded by the host type, so most of them do occur in star-forming galaxies, but we're starting to see um, quiescent and transitioning galaxies. Um, and then great work done by Creasy and Liam here that uncovered um, galaxy cluster FRBs, so very, um, very old FRBs and at least one in like a very red and dead elliptical galaxy also points to um, you know, a broad range of environments. But another kind of noteworthy distinction is that all um, non-star forming galaxies host these apparently non-repeating FRBs. So maybe there's some distinction, um, and if they are from magnetars, this is you know, starting to paint a picture that it's at odds with a single formation channel for these very elusive and prolific events. Okay, so with that, um, I'll just leave with my conclusions and say um, we're characterizing the population of cosmological kilonovae, um, discovering a range of these ejecta masses, and I've told you about a couple of surprise kilonovae that we found from unlikely sources. Um, we have produced the largest sample of short gamma ray burst host galaxies. 
um, and compared them, hopefully, as a baseline com for comparison with LIGO detected mergers. Um, we're uncovering potentially the first um, uh, population of greater than Redshift 1 um, hosts, and p potentially with shorter delay times and possibly a dwarf host population um, aligned with you know, observations of reticulum 2, and we've begun to apply these techniques to FRBs. So with that, I'll take questions. Thanks for your time. Yes. Yeah, we certainly, I forget exactly which IMF we assumed here, but we assumed some, like the Krupa or something for all of them. So certainly, yeah, you could start playing, like before making really definitive statements on the delay time distribution. First of all, we're assuming a functional form uh, for one, so that's, that's one thing. Um, but also, yeah, you can start playing with things like the IMF and how that varies with redshift and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually don't know. I would assume some like log normal distribution around the stellar evolutionary time scales of your core collapse bear bearing supernovae, but yeah, yeah. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, it does. Yeah. How it compares to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you would definitely get, you know, a much lower minimum age. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think that if, um, so, so we did this analysis where if you just put in like one, say 10 million year host, um, that will actually skew the, you know, obviously the minimum delay time significantly. And also the alpha will change a little bit, but we have, if we have like a missing population of very young hosts, that would definitely skew things. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so one, one actually caveat with this work, um, yeah, and everyone, it's like, I'm like fifth author on this, so I'm like trying to be an advocate for Mike's work. Okay, but it was a proof of concept. So I think um, uh, uh, th this is based on parametric star formation history. So that's one thing where we would love to explore this for non-parametric. In that case, you could start to explore the systematics. But there is like, but, but nothing in the parametric star formation histories I think would systematically push you to older, you know, older or younger minimum delay times, but definitely something to explore. Yeah, 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 thanks. Oh, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how, wait, how, can you explain how that has to do with the rates? Well, if yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. If, if mutual probability yes. is very rare, then you would yeah. expect you know, from place to place yes. the abundance of the R process to vary. Oh, to vary. Yes, yes. So yes. is the uniformity of the R process abundance from galaxy to galaxy uh, a constraint that you would it, Yes, that would be. So I, I don't know too much about, so if someone speak up if you know about the, the abundance well, actually, you probably know about the abundances, um, the, the difference in our process abundance. I know this one that I showed, this is kind of the limit of my knowledge here, but reticulum two is like this, this type of our process enhancement. And these are kind of the other ultrafaint dwarfs um, that, that such resolved stellar population studies have been, and it's you know significantly enhanced from this. And so this at least you know it shows that there is some non-uniformity and that this is a great probe of potentially like s some R process producing event had to occur in this galaxy that, that's significant that, that didn't occur in these galaxies. So yeah, but I don't know enough about kind of other types of galaxies beyond this, this work actually, yeah.
but that that would be um, yeah very interesting to probe. Yeah, okay, yes. So that's um, a, another potential long GRB kilonova. So yeah, so this is, um, uh, it was detected by Fermi and then it was um, later, you know, we had um, afterglow observations at later times. So this one is weird because it's very bright. So it's probably the bright, it's, so isotropic energies are like 10 to the 55 erg, which is, yeah, it shatters kind of the, the record for, um, for very, very energetic GRBs. So um, I actually had a Chandra program that kind of tried to look at the, the late time observations to try to constrain the beaming, and we, we have not, um, it, yeah, we have not been able to constrain like the opening angle to try to get a handle on the true energetics. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was this announcement this morning about a JWST kind of very red color. So that is probably another long GRB kilonova candidate, and it's, um, it's interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what yeah. Well, this, these were long GRBs, though. So, but not, but yeah. Not enough, but I, I think so I think we don't know the rates of these like long GRB kilonovi because there's no telltale signature in the gamma rays that could tell no, us. Yeah. 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 This is a kilonova, and you add one kilonova, it's also long. This is thirty seconds. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Fifty seconds. Ten, so ten yeah. seconds. This is thirty seconds. Uh huh. Okay. Well, actually, if you look at those that histogram. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's on a large scale. Even if you just uh, so, I think this <laughs> less than two and more than two is a bit uh, silly. Okay. So uh, anyway, but there's an exercise we can do. It's worthwhile doing, which mm -hmm. is we have enough of a sample. It's not just one, three or four, and then assume putting a best inverse beaming factor. Mm -hmm. You know the volume. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but that would be a useful exercise. I feel like there have been local universe studies of, of short gamma ray bursts to actually try to find things like this, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't actually know. Yeah, but it would be a good exercise. So I would say, my, I'm not done with what I have from just trying to compare the, the rate is very high. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we should have seen, we should have seen them if they all are killing up. Yeah. Let's let's release them. Both of these had kilo mm -hmm. How do you go from that to those being neutron star clusters? As uh, opposed to some other mechanism that the child process that our problems can do because this has happened in the previous in the high blast view for many. So the only other yeah, the only other kind of main channel that's gaining traction for our process is like these R process collapsers. Um, where, yeah, where you're familiar, um, where you could actually have, you know, our process from a massive star. Um, yeah, and so, and your group has done, done work in this, so that's the only thing that I can think of. But if you have something that's like a very red transient that's associated with a gamma ray burst, I think the natural thing to think of is it came from a neutron star merger. There's also yeah. some theoretical ideas that this could be a neutron star white force, you know, so Sure, like sure, many yes. Many yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. the engine. Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely, yeah, especially to try to constrain the gamma rays and figure out what caused that, yeah. Mm -hmm.